Okay, we're going to uh, talk about shame and shadow material. Uh, the information that I'll be reading from is coming from the Anger Management Workbook and Curriculum, Module 5. Uh, this book was actually written by uh, the therapist that I uh, got my anger management certification through from the uh, National Anger Management Association. Um, so shadow material. Uh, when we talk about shadow, the shadow or shadow material, you know, we're not talking about the shadow from our body when lights cast on us. So we're talking about something uh, that we have uh, disassociated or disowned from ourselves. And generally it, it ends up hitting or ends up uh, uh, living in our subconscious, right? So again, we have our conscious mind and then we have the subconscious. The subconscious, again, are the things that we're not aware of. There are still things going on, but we're not necessarily, we're not consciously aware of those things. And, and this is where the shadow is at. And one of the things that uh, causes problems as far as it relates to the shadow um, is that when people don't realize that it's there, right? You don't know what those triggers are and you don't even realize um, that you have shadow material, right? And you can also think of it as our aggressive side as well, right? Um, so on, on most of my... Uh, material or logos, like when I put up a, a logo, a lot of times I'll have um, anger management at the top and then tame your de demons across the bottom. And it's kind of, uh, that's what it's talking about is, is this, where we uh, learn to manage that aggressive side and, and we learn to turn it into something more positive because you can turn it into something positive, right? Because in anger management, uh, for example, we are uh, taught that we should be assertive and not aggressive, right? Where aggressive is, um, you know, acting out uh, badly towards people, uh, whether uh, physical, physically violent, uh, uh, bad words, calling them out of their name. And there's a number of different examples of, of aggressive behavior. And then when you're assertive, Basically, you are um, standing up for your rights, you're setting boundaries, and you're making sure that, uh, you know, people respect you properly, but you're doing it in an appropriate manner, right? You're not uh, threatening them, you're not causing them harm, you're not trying to uh, beat them up or anything like that, right? You're simply um, letting them know uh, where you stand, right? And, 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 and when you're being assertive, you're also respectful of their rights. You're respectful of their rights just as you are requiring that they be respectful of your rights as well. Whereas aggression, you are uh, a lot of times maybe defending yourself, but you will do it at the cost of harming someone else or uh, stepping on their rights. So you don't want your rights to be violated, but you're willing to uh, violate the rights of someone else. Right. So when we start talking about things like the shadow, uh, generally we develop uh, whatever our shadow material and our triggers, um, we develop them in, in childhood generally. Um, and they're from different messages that are uh, given to us by our uh, parents and, 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 and loved ones and people that we respect or, you know, people that we look up to. Right. So if your uh, parents are telling you, you know, that you're bad or that something's wrong with you, you know, that, that really hurts. Right. And especially for a child. Right. And so it, it's important, you know, as parents, if you are a parent, right. To make the message clear of what you're trying to get across. So let's say if your child, let's say the, you know, uh, the little boy hit his little sister, let's say, right. Um, we don't want the child to believe that he's bad, right? We want to know that that behavior is unacceptable, but again, we want to attach the negative to the behavior and not to the child, right? And, and we want to be specific even with the, even with the behavior, right? We don't want to just even throw out just a blanket, uh, hitting is bad or it makes you bad, right? 
because there may come a time that the child may need to defend themselves, right? And they've totally distanced the idea of, uh, you know, any kind of physical aggression from themselves, right? And, and there are some times that it may be necessary, but we want to teach them the, you know, the appropriate uses for it. I think the, uh, one of the best examples that I can think of is people that go to the military. Um, a lot of times you'll have people uh, that choose to enlist in the military and maybe growing up, they may have been like some really aggressive uh, children, you know, maybe not to the point of criminal uh, behavior, maybe even to that point, but uh, generally not necessarily to the point of criminal behavior, but they were very aggressive. And, and had they continued, you know, uh, going in the direction they were going, it's likely that they would have did something that would have possibly, uh, you know, put them in prison or some other uh, undesirable situation. But they go to the military and they receive certain training. Right. And um, and they're able to um, to to learn how to manage that aggressive side and use it for the benefit of the people, for the service of their community and their country. Right. So um, so it's, it's not like they have um, eliminated anger from their lives, but they've learned to. Uh, to get angry for the right reasons, right? So we want to learn, you know, the things that we should get angry about. So we want to get angry for the right reason and we want to be able to deal with it in the correct way or in the right way, right? Uh, and at the right time. So um, again, uh, what I'm going to be reading is coming from the uh, Anger Management Workbook and Curriculum. It's from Module 5 and it's called Shame and Shadow Material. It starts off with an example uh, uh, of the interaction between a mother and, and a child and, and the message that the mother gives the child as the child's trying to be creative. It says, while his mother talks to a neighbor outside the house, a two-year-old child explores the outdoors. He finds a special place near where he digs happily in the soft soil. He feels proud of his accomplishment. Look at me, he wants to tell the world. Look what I can do. I'm good. Just look at this mess, says his mother with scorn. Look at you. You are filthy dirty. Your clothes are ruined. I'm disappointed in you. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. The child experiences himself as very small. He drops his head and stares at the ground. He sees his dirty hands and clothes and begins to feel dirty inside. He believes there must be something very bad about him, something so bad he can never really be clean. He fears his mother's disdain and sees himself as defective and small. OK, so again, um, this could like some people would say, oh, this could be kind of extreme right there, you know, uh, but we got to realize that as 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 parents. Um, we give this, these messages over and over again to our children. And as children, we receive these messages over and over again. And again, from well-intentioned parents, they were just trying to discipline us and, and get us on the right path and not have us out making trouble for everyone. But when you're dealing with the brain of a child, you have to be, you want to be clear about the message. And you also want to be clear about what's actually bad, right? So it's not that the child is bad or there's something wrong with the child. There's something wrong with the behavior or the way that the behavior um, is done. And we want to be clear about that. Right. So um, even in this situation, you know, we could point out or the parent could point out the fact that, oh, you know, hey, you know, I see you're trying to be creative and that. Hey, that looks pretty good. But. You know, you look at your clothes, you know, you know, you want to you don't want to go out in your good clothes and you know, get your, your good clothes all dirty while you're out playing and stuff. Right. Because that's all the child was doing was being creative and, and you know, out playing or whatever, playing in the mud. Right. So again, that's, there's a different message there, right. Between look at you, you're dirty. Right. So again, a child, and again, the mother is talking about the physical condition. I'm sure the mother didn't intend or didn't mean that the child is inherently dirty or there's something inherently wrong with the child, but it's still the message received. 
right? And as we get these messages over and over again, we begin to internalize them. So for us, it's really important that we figure out what are our triggers, what, what is our shadow material, and what are our triggers, right? And it's very dangerous not to know what those triggers are. And the people that, in, in my opinion, the people that are in the most danger um, of, of uh, possibly running into problems from their shadow material are the people that don't realize that they have it or, the, you know, our, you know, good citizens that think that, you know, they, they got it all together and that they, uh, you know, never could act out uh, violently or act out in any uh, criminal way or anything like that. And they think it's just not in them. Right. And so it's these people that will tend to get caught off guard and they will commit horrible crimes. Right. Spur of the moment. Usually. Right. It's not like usually it's not even necessarily something that they plotted out, plotted and planned and stuff, stuff like that. Right. It's it's something that happens, something uh, maybe they, you know, catch their wife or husband cheating, let's say, and they just totally, uh, you know, just totally lose their cool and, and just flip out on them or. Um, you know, uh, a friend, you know, might say something, uh, you know, to another friend and it's something that this person has had problems with in the past. And, and, but the other friend don't know it, you know, they're just joking or playing or something like that, but they say a certain word and it kind of triggers them. And maybe they just automatically just tee off on them, you know, and start beating them up and they're, and maybe they were really good friends and they're wondering like, what the hell, you know, what the hell is that? And so after the fight, you know, if they even, end up ever being friends again, you know, it's like, well, what the hell went on? Right. And that person may not necessarily be able to explain it because again, it's shadow material. There are things that that these are the things that are happening for us subconsciously. Right. And again, and and generally we don't know what they are. We can figure it out. Right. So when we examine ourselves, right, examine our triggers and, and become more mindful, we can figure out the things that trigger us. Right. And we can uh, begin to work on those things so that they don't uh, continue uh, to cause unnecessary problems in our lives. But if if I'm totally unaware that I have the capacity for violence, then that's a problem because everybody has the capacity to commit violence. Right. Not everybody goes around acting out violently. Right. For sure. And thankful they don't, but everybody has the capacity to do so, put in the right situation and circumstances, right? So even when we think of some of the most horrific things like throughout history, you know, you could think of, we can think of all kinds of different examples of things that happened, right? Whether we talk about uh, mass shooting situations, um, uh, slavery, Holocaust, stuff like that, right? And, um, you know, and we look at these situations or, or the activities that happen during uh, during these times and we look and we like, man, I could never I could never do something like that. Right. But the problem is that you could hopefully you never will. And if you are, you know, uh, practicing mindfulness and you're aware of your behavior and you take responsibility for your actions and you pay attention to the consequences, it's a good possibility that you won't uh, act out in that way but you could, and you need to realize that you could do that, right? So you want to be careful and you want to um, uh, constantly uh, work on yourself and know that you're not immune from acting out violently or aggressively and, and actually harming someone, even people that you love, or I would even say, especially people that you love, right? Because it, it, it's common that people will hurt, I mean, even physically hurt, the people that they love and care about more are more in, you know, more severe than they do even people that they don't like. The reason is the emotional attachment to that person or to those people, right? If someone who I am, who I actually care about, really care about, uh, does something extremely offensive to me, it's going to hurt me more than if some random person said or did the same thing, right? And the fact that it's going to hurt more is important here because anger is a defense against vulnerability. And if you feel hurt, 
right? You're not going to sit there feeling hurt for very long. You're going to begin to get angry, right? If somebody hurts your feelings, you, you don't just sit there with hurt feelings, right? I mean, your feelings hurt, but you start getting pissed off and you start figuring out a way that you can get revenge, you know? And the reason is anger is a defense against vulnerability. So anger comes as in as our defense mechanism. So we want to be able to tame that anger or tame those demons within us, right? So that we can use it to our benefit. And that's where we uh, talk about being assertive, right? So in anger management, you know, we're taught, we, we're told or we're taught to be assertive and not aggressive, right? The difference is with aggression, you are uh, standing up for yourself, but generally you're doing it in such a way that you are uh, violating the rights or you're willing to violate the rights and, and harm other people in the process as long as you get your point across and as long as your rights are respected, right? Whereas with assertive, you are standing up for yourself, you're standing up for your rights, but you are respecting the rights and, 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 and um, rights and desires of the other person as well. So um, there's a, you know, and there's a big difference there. Now, as we, you know, learn to tame the demon, sometimes they'll talk about it as incorporating the shadow, right? So as we uh, learn to incorporate the shadow, or incorporate the aggressive side, right? We actually need that to be assertive because if we, if we're not assertive, so you have assertive, assertive, you have aggressive, but you also have passive, right? Passive is just as bad as aggression. Right now, you don't necessarily get in the same type of trouble um, from being passive as you do for aggression, or at least you don't get in immediate trouble. Right. But over time, if you, if you continue to be passive every time people are just running over you, then eventually you're going to snap and you're likely going to act out more violently than you would have if you just would have been aggressive in the first place. Right. So again, I'm not advocating the aggression. That's what we don't want to do. We want to be assertive, not aggressive, not aggressive. But again, we also don't want to be passive. And one way to think about passivity or, or just staying passive and letting people just run over you. And that's like stuffing it. Because when we talk about anger, right, there are uh, three general ways that people uh, manage anger. They will stuff it. That's being passive where you just stuff it. You don't respond to it. You don't say anything about the situation or whatever, you uh, act out aggressively, right? So you just, you know, totally uh, lose your cool or whatever and act out aggressively or you manage it. That's our objective. That's what we're trying to do. We're learning to manage our anger. So again, it's not that you're never going to get angry, but you will get angry unless something's wrong with you. If you, if you never get angry, there's something wrong right? There's something wrong with you. Uh, and you, you may need, you know, you may need help, but you don't have to be aggressive. And there's a difference, right? So when you're punching somebody in the face, that's not anger, that's aggression, right? Now you may be punching them in the face because you're angry, right? So you're acting out aggressively because you're angry, but the punching in the face is not the anger, Right. And the reason I want to emphasize that is because, again, we don't get in trouble because of our anger, technically. Right. And uh, and I say and I used to say and I still say sometimes, hey, I always get in trouble because of my anger. Right. But that's not technically true. Right. It's true, but not true. It's 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 true in the sense that I would get angry, act out aggressively. And that was the most common thing that would get me in trouble getting angry and acting out aggressively, right? But technically it's not true because again, it wasn't the fact that I got upset, that I got angry, that got me in trouble. It was that I acted out aggressively. I decided to hit the person or shoot the person or stab the person, you know, act out violently, right? So that's the reason uh, that we get in trouble. And that's what we want to learn to manage. We want to learn to manage you know, how we respond to anger, right? And again, we want to respond to it and not react. There's a difference between that as well. Responding, I'm doing something and I'm, uh, you know, uh, having a behavior, performing a behavior after I make a reasoned uh, decision and, and I perform the behavior. Whereas 
react. I'm just reacting. Right. And, um, you know, you think of it makes me always whenever I mention to respond or react, it always make me think about, you know, the knee jerk reaction. People use that phrase knee jerk reaction. And what that was referring to is when the doctor would check people reflexes and they would tap the person on the knee with the hammer and your knee would move would involuntarily would just jerk. Right. It was just jerk like your leg would just jerk. Right. It wasn't like you even, you know, you, you didn't have any control over it. It just happened. Right. And some of us, that's the way that we react to our anger. Right. Somebody does something and you just hit them. Right. Or you just cuss them out, you know, or whatever. Um, and you don't even think about it. And then later, when you think about what you did, you're like, oh, shit, you know, damn, now I'm getting, you know, I'm getting in trouble. And then you start thinking about the consequences. But at that point, it's too damn late. Right. You're thinking about the consequences after you've already, you know, committed the aggressive act. Right. We have to begin to consider the consequences before we take action. Right. And so that's why we want to have a, a thing where we're able to pause. Right. And think about what we're doing. Uh, before we act out. But continuing with this, it says uh, the problem of shame. It says shame begins in very young children as an emotion that requires another person. As children, we have three options for dealing with shame. One, find a caring other to attach us with love and approval. Or two, uh, try to avoid the shame experience somehow or three, comply with the shaming message, right? Since infants and children don't always have an, op an optimally uh, attached parent, meaning a parent that is, is saying optimally attached parent, so meaning a parent that is well-trained in parenting, let's say, right? Because a lot of, time, uh, a lot of parents are first-time parents, and even though there is a such thing as parenting classes, everybody hasn't necessarily, you know, uh, participated in parenting classes, nor is there any, uh, you know, it's not like a, a, a owner manual for your child, like how to raise the child, what to say, what don't say. Now, a lot of things that people, you know, uh, you know, used to do all of a sudden, you know, we're hearing, oh, it caused a lot of trauma and this and that and the children. But these were things that we were even taught by even the professionals, the doctors, the therapists to do certain things or to act a certain way. And now they're saying, no, uh, don't do that. That's, you know, that's bad. That causes harm. It, causes, it damages the child and stuff like that. So even even, you know, the best intentioned parent, you know, will uh, make mistakes. Right. So but as much as we can learn. Uh, to correct the behavior, our behavior, um, the better for us moving towards our children. But now for those of us that have anger issues, maybe again, we develop these things in our own childhood. And again, I'm not saying, oh, blame your parents or blame. You don't blame anybody, right? Because any decision that we make, right, especially from the time that we're an adult, we're responsible for those decisions, regardless of your upbringing, regardless of your childhood, regardless of your economic status or any of these other things, all of those things that we use to try to explain why we are the way that we are, are excuses, right? Now, they're somewhat true because we are a product of our experience. Like we, we do learn from our experiences. We get messages from our experiences and we conduct our behavior or we react and respond to other people based on our past experiences. That's true. However, we still know right from wrong. And when we make a decision to do something that we know is wrong, that's our responsibility. And again, it's not about blame. I don't like to necessarily use the word blame. I, re I prefer to use the word responsibility, right? That's our responsibility. We take responsibility and we own that. And then we correct the behavior, right? And and not to be shame and not feel shame about it. Right. I remember growing up as a kid. Right. I was born in Louisiana. And um, and one of the things, especially old folks would always say, if you did something wrong, they'd be like, boy, what's wrong with you? You should be ashamed of yourself for that. Right. Now, that's a very bad message from a, from an anger management standpoint. Now, again, I don't blame the older people in my family for saying stuff like that. I don't think it did some horrible uh, 
it turned me into some horrible person or anything like that. But you should be ashamed of yourself. That's a problem because shame is a problem. Now, if you do something wrong, then you should have a certain amount of guilt, right? You know, we, we have um, a certain amount of guilt about things if we do something wrong and you should. And even with the guilt, you shouldn't take it overboard, right? Because um, if it's done, it's done, right? You make amends, you, you know, you apologize to the person if someone was involved or you figure out some way that you can try to right the wrong and then you move on, right? You don't sit there and continue to beat yourself up over it, right? But you do own it. You take responsibility for it. And when you take responsibility, you have a better opportunity to correct it. Because again, if I'm pointing a finger at other people and it's always somebody else's fault, I'm never going to correct the behavior because there's no behavior to correct, right? I didn't do anything wrong. It was that person's fault, right? So if that's the message that I'm giving myself, then I'm just a victim, right? Of other people's action. I'm a victim of other people pissing me off. I'm a victim of, you know, and that's, again, we got the whole victim thing uh, happening now in our society. Um, okay, uh, here we go. Small children generally can't self-regulate shame. So in the absence of an attuned caregiver, they deal with it as best they can using their magical worldviews emergent memory capacities and immature self defenses a rather a rather typical child child's defense is their experience of shame almost immediately moving through humiliation to rage right so now this is important and again it's talking about a child but this is what happens to us so again if somebody says something that embarrasses you an embarrassment is a a type of kind of a, a, a similar to, we'll call it a lightweight shame for our purposes, right? So you feel a certain amount of embarrassment, but you start getting angry with that person because they embarrass you and you want to, you know, stomp them out, right? And that's because, again, anger is coming in. Your demons, your aggressive side, your shadow is coming in to protect you. It's making you feel stronger because as you begin to get angry, you don't feel you, you, you feel less shame. You also feel less fear if fear was involved, you know, as well, right? Any of those emotions that make us feel vulnerable, anger comes in as a defense against those things, right? And those, uh, emotions that make us feel vulnerable or make us feel weak generally come from a place in our brain called the amygdala. And the amygdala is also the place where anger comes from and anger will push out those other emotions that are in the, uh, in the amygdala. Okay. The, uh, parasympathetic collapse of shame or the withdrawal into unacceptability is avoided by stimulating the sympathetic rush of rage which uh, feels more powerful and terrible and tolerable. Here lies the problem of shame in anger management. Shame is a tricky emotion. So again, um, so this is like when the child, so let's say you uh, totally shame the child, the sh child get, you know, totally shame or embarrassed. Generally when, ch when children are hurt, not just physical pain, but even emotional pain, they begin to, you know, they get angry and they cry and yell and scream or maybe hit something or whatever. Right. So, again, we we started this in a, at a very young age when we were little children. Right. We started breaking things. You get mad and you break something. Right. Um, and maybe they fall on the floor. You know, they talk about the. Uh, uh, what do they call it? The parasympathetic collapse of shame. Right. So, you know, when a child get in just all to fall out and, and have a little temper tantrum, right? Emotions regulate and influence everything we think or do, including our moods, our sympathetic and parasympathetic autonomic balance, our beliefs, and our social relationships. If we are relaxed, 
wide open and accepting, our emotions will naturally flow with our purpose of the moment. Emotion that is defensively repressed, amplified, or forbidden cannot easily flow back into a healthy rhythm of harmony and needs firm internal guidance or self-regulation. One of the problems with shame is that we don't develop, excuse me, we don't develop the neural brain structures to be able to process it with mature self-awareness until we are at a at very least adolescence. In particular, around 11, we just begin to be able to handle competing concepts at the same time. We just begin to have the capacity to consider that shame is an unpleasant experience that indicates we have violated an internal sense of how we should be and that we need to tolerate the discomfort all while accepting ourselves as imperfect but lovable beings. So again, um, as we begin to, or as the person experiences shame, uh, one of the ways as far as them to be able to, to develop healthy, they have to be able to endure that shame and realize that they are a decent person or a, a healthy and worthy person. Because the person that, that has shame, uh, a large amount of shame has, you know, again, they think that there's something inherently wrong with them, right? They don't even like themselves. So, you know, of course they think that other people don't like them and they will have a tendency to interpret people's actions towards them in the most negative way, right? They will always think that the person is saying something or uh, talking about them when they may or may not be talking about them. If somebody's whispering in the room, they assume that they're whispering about them, uh, especially if they happen to be looking anywhere in their general direction. Um, everything ends up coming out uh, being interpreted in the most negative way. And so, of course, right, um, everybody's picking on you. So, of course, you're going to get angry. Right. I mean, it's not they're not actually picking on you. But if that's what you're thinking. Right. Then that's what it is to you. Right. And that's what you're going to act on. Younger children's brains have difficulties tolerating any discomfort, such as shame, emotions, much less looking for guidance and wisdom in such discomfort. This means everybody's initial preparation in dealing with shame has aspects of trying to avoid the experience and that certain forms of more mature processing can only be learned when we are more aware. So again, trying to avoid the discomfort, right? Um, that's how we begin to develop that shadow, right? Because we're trying to, to avoid the discomfort of shame. So if there's something about me that I have shame, that I feel shamed about, or that I'm just told I would be shamed if, if people found out, then I'm trying to not only hide it from people, but I send it deep down into my subconscious and I don't even admit it to myself. Right. And this is what happens with a lot of people, uh, even people that. Um, so e even people that and now it has been uh, it's more. Common, let's say, uh, for people to, to come out or to, the phrase come out the closet or whatever, if somebody's, let's say, uh, uh, you know, dealing with like uh, same same sex orientation, uh, sexual orientation. Right. And so, you know, for a long time, it wasn't even acceptable for them to even speak on who they were. And so you had a lot of people that would, you know, hide anything about themselves. And they even had like. Uh, um, I don't remember what the places were called, but they had uh, like the places that they would go and, you know, hang out and kind of get together, but it would all, everything would be done seek in secret. Right. And if anybody found out, you know, they would, you know, have this shame that was uh, attached to that. Right. Cause they're trying to totally, you know, avoid this shame. Right. The thing about shame and, and in here, in this particular book at 
in later sections that actually talk about healthy and unhealthy shame. In my opinion, when we talk shame, um, I don't look at shame as being healthy at all, right? Shame. Now, guilt, on the other hand, you can, you know, be guilt to a reasonable degree. I mean, feel guilt to a reasonable degree because if if I do something wrong, if I cause harm to you unnecessarily and, and I violate your rights, then I should feel guilty about that and I should make amends for that. But I shouldn't even overdo it on the guilt, right? I shouldn't spend every waking moment, you know, just thinking about, oh, I messed up, right? I need to correct it and move on. Shame and guilt can sometimes be confused. Guilt is when you have done something wrong. Shame is when you are something wrong. For example, a child might feel guilt if she broke her mother's vase and hid the pieces, but she might feel shame if her mother then told her she was a clumsy, no good sneak who would never amount to anything, right? So again, these are different messages, right? So in this example, obviously, um, this is a very negative message that the parents given a child. <coughs> Unfortunately, most of us have received messages just like this, if not the exact same message, right? We received the messages that look at you, you're always messing up. You're never going to be anything good. You're never going to amount to anything. And we begin to internalize these things. And for those of us that maybe even went on to commit crimes. It's not an excuse for our criminal behavior, right? Regardless of how we grew up, what happened to us as a child is not an excuse. However, right, many of us carried that into that behavior, right? We didn't feel as bad or as guilty about our criminal behavior because why should I? I'm no good anyway. I'm never going to amount to anything. I'm never going to be nothing but a two-bit criminal. So I'm just being who I am. Right. So obviously it's actually wrong, but that's the message that we end up getting. And that's the message or the way that we try to justify it to ourselves. And sometimes and generally it's BS, like deep down, we know that we're wrong, but at the same time, it's what we use as a defense. Shame as an in inevitable human experience. Most of us have felt shame because, as mentioned, it is perhaps an inevitable human experience. We all suffered feelings of incompetence, inadequacy, or inferiority, known a, known a sense of failure or defect, been scorned or unacceptable to another. Shame is among the most painful of human feelings. If we were to listen to it all the time, we might have, or excuse me, we might be driven to take desperate actions or just give up in despair. This shame often seems too painful to endure, which helps us to understand why it often goes underground to our unconscious or subconscious. We can defend against our shame so well that we are literally unaware of it. And when it says defend against our shame, this is not a good thing. So in this book, it also talks about some survival strategies for shame. And when it's talking about these survival strategies, it's, it's, it's saying things that we do as survival strategies for shame, but it's not giving us advice to use these. It's just saying that these are the things that we do, but they're maladaptive, right? They're maladaptive uh, survival strategies for shame. And they're generally things that are going to cause more problems than they're going to help, right? So what we want to do, we want to be aware if we are um, having these shame, uh, experiences and we want to figure out what's going on and we want to get rid of the shame. If it's something that we did, then we just need to take responsibility for that because, you know, if it's what's done is done, even if people choose not to, um, interact with you, if they find out whatever, so what, right. Uh, find other people that will, because there's always other people that will, but don't let the shame destroy you. A lot of people, even especially people uh, that commit suicide, a lot of times, um, shame is one of the main culprits, right? For a lot of people, right? They have something that they've done. You know, think about um, these people that get caught in these, you know, really messed up situations on some real bad crimes and stuff like that. 
and it's not that they're that they are uh, necessarily worried about doing time. Sometimes it might even be stuff that are not necessarily criminal, but it brings a lot of shame on them, and they feel that they're shaming the family's name. And and so to to save face, they may go the route of suicide, which is never the answer, right? Um, what's that cliche they say about suicide? It's a uh, a permanent solution for a temporary problem, right? Um, we don't want to go there, right? We want to be able to face the shame, confront it, and address it, right? Even if sometimes people might need to even, uh, uh, you know, go to therapy to, to have to get help. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with going to therapy. As one of my professors told me, he said, hey, you know, I'm a therapist, but I have a therapist and my therapist has a therapist. And the reason for that is that we're human. Right. Regardless of our educational level, regardless of our uh, financial status or whatever, we are human beings and we all have problems and we all have things uh, that we need to work on. We all have things that we could work on. Right. Now, the things we need to work on are the things that are constantly causing problems for us and are not allowing us to be successful. The things we could work on are things that we can improve that would just help us to move uh, to be that much better, uh, with our lives. Right. So, um, so when we, again, when we're talking about this, this shadow and incorporating or integrating the shadow, um, that's just about us being able to integrate, uh, that our aggressive side and using it in a positive way, you know? So for example, um, somebody that grew up, let's say they grew up, uh, Let's say if you grew up in the gangs and stuff like that, right? And obviously you grew up in gangs at some point, you know, you in, uh, engaged in some violent activity, just, you know, just as part of just being in the gang, right? You engaged in, in, in violence, aggressive, aggressive behavior and stuff like that, right? Now, as decent citizens is what we're trying to be. Um, we don't unnecessarily engage in violence, but let's say, you know, you happen to be walking down the street and you just see some, you know, random person just beating up on some old lady or some child or something like that. Right. And that's when that comes in. Right. We're not afraid to engage this person. Right. And this old lady who happens to who's helpless or this child who's helpless. Right. Um, we're able to help and assist them, right? But we're doing it for something good, not for our pride, right? So, uh, you know, not because somebody calls you a bitch or calls you a liar or calls you, you know, the N word, whatever, right? Um, if they're not touching you, then you shouldn't be touching them, right? Of course, you know, and we will, you know, and, we, and people say, well, I got a right to defend myself. Yes, you do, right? But they attack you verbally. Right. Verbal and physical, two different things. Right. So they attack you verbally. You stump them out. You're going to prison. Right. You're the one that's going to jail. So. Uh, what's that silly cliche they use in recovery? Sometimes it's like drinking poison, hoping the other person die. Right. So, I mean, you could think about it this way. So the person has did something to harm you or you consider they harmed you, whatever name that they happen to call you that offended you so much. Right. So they did something against you. So you're going to do something that's going to make your situation even worse. Right now, thinking about it, you'd be like, yeah, that don't really make sense. Right. But we do it all the time. Right. We do it all the time. So that's what we want to get away from. And that's the purpose of this anger management is to help us to manage our anger in a way that we won't continue to do things that are going to cause us problems and, and continue to interfere with our life. Right. So uh, we're going to get into some more uh, stuff with the anger management in the upcoming lessons.